today we're continuing to explore that theme of joy and you know the autumn equinox was yesterday so today will be a shorter day than the night and uh, so that will continue to expand until the winter solstice and so we're in that next phase and so we're going to talk about the phases that we go through and expressing joy and expanding in joy and so we're expanding in that experience of joy we started out the month by declaring an intention to experience more joy this month to look for that joy to remember that everything necessary to the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is mine now everything necessary to the most complete full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is mine now because of who I am the incarnation of the one life and we talked about how that experience of joy changed over time and how we looked for different things that that joy experience came in different ways over time and we talked about each of us being capable of being miracle workers that a miracle is just something that we do that other people may not understand but that brings us joy and brings a greater experience of joy to the world like those senior um, athletes who do amazing things the hundred year old tennis player um, those kinds of things and so we saw that there was an evolution of joy on ongoing and we're part of that evolution we're part of that evolutionary process because we are all on the hero's journey some of you may have seen the movie that we showed last month called Finding Joe and it was about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and the hero's journey essentially is there is something that happens there is a calling there is an experience that separates us from our ordinary life now sometimes that experience is one that we don't want sometimes it's the loss of a loved one sometimes it's the um, experience of uh, financial um, falling out there is a uh, health challenge all of these things take us out of our ordinary lives and bring us into an experience of not knowing who we are where we are and where we're going and so this hero's journey continues and it allows us to step into over a threshold into this area of called initiation and in the initiation we find mentors we find powers we didn't know we had we fight dragons we get the gift whatever that gift is and then we come back to our lives and we tell our story and the story becomes a a benefit to others the story allows us to telling the story allows us to gain more meaning from the story it allows us to experience the meaning of that that we overcame and we went through and this doesn't have to be a big old deal it could be many different things that occur in our lives so I was talking to my mentor the Reverend Dr. Margaret Stortz on Friday and she related to me an experience that she had had that morning and it's sort of like that hero's journey where she um, got up in the morning and her son said you know the Endeavor is going to be flying over the Golden Gate Bridge today so we should go out and see it and so it was like oh you know okay it's, it's going to be a little dot over the Golden Gate Bridge but oh well you know so we'll go out there we'll disrupt our morning routine and we will you know so there's always resistance you know whenever we're going to have an experience like this there's always a resistance but we overcome the resistance and so she she went out on the deck and they're standing on the deck it's a beautiful day they live in El Cerrito which is in the East Bay Hills they have a clear view straight from their deck to the Golden Gate Bridge and so they're standing there waiting the appearance of the Endeavor at the Golden Gate Bridge and all of a sudden 
the 747 comes over their heads, directly over their heads. The roar of the engines is deafening. It's right over their heads. And they can see the plane. They can see the Endeavor. They can see everything on it. Reverend Victor, who's Reverend Margaret's husband, swears he saw the pilot waving. <laughs> And there was this experience of, of this plane going over and the endeavor going over and then, and then circling around and up into the Marin headlands and then down over the Golden Gate Bridge and over San Francisco and down the peninsula and back up again in a big circle around the bay before it went off. And it was, she said it was a transformative experience because it was one of those experiences where you have awe and uh, amazement, amazement. She was just in amazement. And the thing is, she was not alone in that amazement because there were other people on their decks and there are people in the parks down in the East Bay and there are people in the parks in San Francisco and over in the East Bay and all of these people gathered outside of buildings in San Francisco to watch this occurrence. And so there is this shared experience, this shared consciousness of awe and wonder to see this shuttle that had traveled millions of miles and been in space and done all this work to bring things up to the space, you know, to the space station that's zooming around us all the time. Um, and to, to just have that experience together and to realize at her age, she said, you know, she's on the high side of 70s, and she said, I'm still capable of amazement, <laughs> of awe, of wonder. That's a good thing, amazement. After all I've seen, I can still be amazed. And so... Yes, so there, is, so there is that feeling that, you know, there was this resistance. There was, okay, I'm going to do this. And then something entirely different happens. And there is that awesome feeling and experience and a feeling of oneness with all the other people who were also having this experience. And then telling about it. So they went out to breakfast afterwards and she just wanted to tell everybody in the restaurant. <laughs> you can't believe what happened this morning, you know? So we want to tell the story. We want to tell that story. We want to share with each other that experience that we've had. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to share that experience of that awe and that wonder and that journey that we have been on that allowed us to overcome obstacles. Because when we were on the hero's journey, no one else has done this journey. Our journey is unique. When the knights in the round table entered the forest looking for the grail, each one had to take their own path. No one could take anyone else's path. We've seen Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, you know, Harry Potter. They're all stories of reluctant heroes. The people in them didn't necessarily want to be a hero. They didn't think of themselves as heroes, bless you. And still, they were called, they had a calling to step out of their ordinary lives and to step into seeing life as an adventure and not knowing what the next step is but living in trust, living in faith in their own possibility and capabilities. In this month's Science of Mind, there's a wonderful article by Tama Keeves. I guess it's about Tama Keeves, it's not by her. But um, Tama Keeves was a Harvard-educated lawyer, had a job in a really high-powered legal firm, and, you know, she had all the stuff. She had the car, she had the flat, she had all the stuff that, as everybody said, was, she was supposed to have that would make her happy. And she was dying. She was just dying. Her soul wanted to be a writer. Her soul wanted to express in a whole different way. 
And so she left it all. She left it all. And for a while, she didn't know, you know, she was living on friends' couches. And she was like, didn't know what she was going to do. But she just knew she couldn't do that anymore, that that was not who she was. And that's what happens when we take the hero's journey. We step out of what we're supposed to be doing into what we're really supposed to be doing because we're stepping into our authentic selves. We're stepping into that inner call, that inner voice that is telling us uniquely what it is that we are to do. And so it's, it's a shift. And she took that shift and things are revealed. So this is why we have to have patience with the process. It doesn't come. Somebody doesn't say, here's the book. All the instructions are here. Do, exa- do this and you're fine. You know, it doesn't happen that way. You have to take one day at a time, one step at a time, and listen to that inner voice. She says, you know, the experts are all going to tell you this and that and the other thing. You have to listen to your inner expert because nobody else has done it the way you can. Don't let the experts tell you about the past. Allow yourself to get in touch with that inner guide that takes you to a place that has never been seen before, that only you can show us, that only you can do. And so now, you know, she wrote a book called This Time I Dance, and it's all about her journey. And now she speaks all over the world and counsels people and has a life that she loves and that sustains and supports her. Because she's doing what she loves. She's following her bliss. And that's another part of this hero's journey, is figuring out what brings you bliss. And what is bliss? Well, in this movie, they define it as a feeling of serene fulfillment. When you're just in that place where you're just doing what you know you want to do that you couldn't not do. You're in a place of doing what you couldn't not do. And when you're in that place, you are in that place of serene fulfillment. And then you know, ah, bliss. It's not about pleasure. It's not about attainment. It's not about fame. It's about the experience of that serene fulfillment. And we each have that capability and that possibility And we each express it uniquely and can do amazing things or just little things. Just little things can make a difference. Just telling one story that helps somebody through a hard time. Um, And there are sometimes amazing things that we can do. I was listening to Science Friday on NPR on Friday. And there was a story about a doctor there who has discovered this um, wonderful thing called an extracellular matrix. And this extracellular matrix has been used for several years um, to help people. It's sort of like a, a webbing that they thought just sort of held the cells together. But no. It's not just holding the cells together. It's actually telling the cells in the body they need to produce more cells. And so he is taking this material, which he gleans from pigs, and he takes this material and sort of cuts away everything that's unnecessary. He makes what he calls a scaffolding. And what he did was, there was a 28-year-old soldier from Afghanistan who, um, this is an American soldier who went to Afghanistan. He was in a vehicle that was hit by a roadside bomb and lost a huge chunk of his thigh muscle. And this thigh muscle, he could move his leg backwards, but he couldn't kick forward. And that's what you do when you walk, is you're kicking forward. And so he walked with great difficulty, and he said he got very good at falling. And they did a lot of surgery on his leg. They did everything they could, but they had done all that they could over several years. And so what this new doctor did, his name is Stephen Baliak, 
Badlak, body lack, body lack, body lack. He um, took away all the scar tissue and he put this extracellular matrix there. And the extracellular matrix told all those cells, you need to start building some muscle. So it got his own body to send more muscle tissue to that space. And within two weeks, he was hunting with his buddies. Now, he still has a hole, but he's got so much muscle tissue, and it's still growing muscle tissue, that it's restoring his leg. They've done this to six different soldiers. It's funded by the Department of Defense, your tax dollars at work, in a really wonderful thing. They have openings up to 80 participants, if you have an injury on a major muscle group that is older than six months, you may qualify for this. And they are, all six guys that they've worked with so far have had amazing results. So there's another doctor at Wake Forest University who is using a printer with cells instead of ink to create organs, layer by layer. He's working on creating kidneys because they have so many people waiting on the list for kidneys and not enough kidneys. So they're working on developing these kidneys out of tissue, out of cells, outside the body that they can then implant into people. And they, you know, a printer, a printer. <laughs> It boggles the mind. Plus, they have spray-on skin for burn victims. So, you know, this man, Stephen Badliak, said he loves to get up in the morning. He can hardly wait to go to work because he loves what he do. He, what he does, what he do. He <laughs> loves what he does. He loves what he does. He follows his bliss. He follows his bliss, and his bliss is that unique healing for all of us. And I'm sure he has encountered obstacles. He has encountered people who didn't believe, you know, in the, the, the process enough to give it funding. But somehow he convinced somebody to get the funding. And he has, you know, obstacles in getting the people to, to participate. But, you know, he perseveres, and he's guided and he has inner strength, and he has tools, and he can tell the story, which enables more of that good to come into experience. So this journey that is the, the, the departure or the separation from regular life, and then there is the initiation and the struggle and the, the things that we have to go through, the dragons that we have to fight, but then there is the gift in that, and then there is the story. And we do this over and over and over. We are continuously on the hero's journey, confronting new challenges, being separated from what we thought was normal. Now our normal changes. I mean, have you ever experienced your normal changing? I have. So, you know, that it changes. And so we have to find our new space, our new place. We have to be willing to step out in faith to experience that journey that is uniquely ours. Nobody else can tell us how to do it. We can't listen to our beloved friends and our family who say, don't do that. Oh, that, you know, her, Tom or Keeve's parents, you know, were like, oh, you'll never make any money doing that. You know, Fleetwood Mac, said he wanted to be a drummer. And his dad said, you know, you will never survive. But here, here's a drum set, go to London, see what you can do. And he was thinking he would, you know, fail and come home with his tail between his legs, but no. He went on to become an international star. Oops. Because he was following his <coughs> desire. He was following his bliss. And the universe supports us in amazing ways. We've talked about that before, that the, when you're committed to following your bliss, the universe supports you, shows up, but you've got to be listening. You've got to be listening. You've got to be looking out. 
I've got to be taking action when the call comes to do what is necessary for, to do your part in bringing this into realization. I have to acknowledge um, the passing this week of uh, Helen Williams of Williams Stationery. I have to say something about that because, you know, she worked until she was 92, which is this year. She worked uh, because, for two reasons, well, she, three reasons actually. She said, um, she continued to work because it gives me a reason to get up in the morning. It gives me social contact with others, and it gives me a reason to buy new clothes. <laughs> but she was living her bliss. She said, if you can't do something nice for somebody, it's a wasted day. So that's what her bliss was, was doing something nice for somebody every single day. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But it's our thing. It's our thing. So if you found that thing, keep on keeping on. And if you're still looking for that thing, just open up. It's right there. It's right there. And it is that that calls your heart. It is that inner bliss. So we're experimenting with joy. We're calling forth more joy. We're doing it through affirming that. And last week we had an affirmation that we did together and I'd invite us to do it again today to just remind ourselves. I am joy at play in the world. 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 And so it is.